Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Trust you had a wonderful weekend. Let's move on to Africa. Kabila government amended the constitution ahead of the 2011 election, scrapping a second round runoff. With the opposition divided, this makes it much easier for Shadari to win or to look like he has, and I can't agree with ISS Africa more. Um, I think Kabila's totally in charge. Madagascar, second round grudge match, the second round of the Madagascar presidential election on 19th December promises to be a hard fight between two sworn enemies, Mark Rabo Lamanana, who led the country from 202 to 209, and Andrew Rajolina, the man who deposed him in a coup and was a DJ. In 1950, the average African had almost twice as much income as the average Asian. At 63% of the world's average, she wasn't far behind the typical global citizen either. By 2016, the opposite was true. The average Asian made close to 80% of the average global citizen but the average African was relatively worse off, making a little over 40% the worldwide average, by a dramatic turnaround. Just nuts, this is Reuters breaking views, Edward Cropley. Magafuli's latest economic plan is in all senses his nuttiest. By buying up the entire cashew harvest at a near 100% premium, the Tanzanian president hopes to help farmers. In fact, it will only serve to show that statist middling comes with a downside. Magafuli's scheme has a certain base logic. Uh, political logic, farmers are an important constituency. Last year, cashews was the most valuable export crop, earning $540 million. But in promising to pay farmers a dollar and 44 cents for this year's 20, 220,000 ton cashew harvest, the president has made it the government's problem to sell them on. And then saying, basically, without cashy cash, Tanzania's $56 billion economy looks, looks a touch shaky. Shilling has shed nearly 1% against the dollar last week, close to record low. Re Europe on repayment due. And I don't think he's got this balance sheet to support this. Airbnb homes it on African growth story. Three of Airbnb's top growth markets are in Africa, and the continent has become a cornerstone of the U.S. company's sustainable tourism strategy. More than 3.5 million customers have stayed with Airbnb hosts across the continent since the company began operating in Africa, with roughly half of those coming in the past year. South Africa constitutes the bulk of that business, followed by Morocco, Kenya and Egypt, but the rest of the continent is catching up. They're off a relatively small base, but that kind of growth has been really encouraging. Since its founding in 2008, Airbnb hosts across Africa have earned more than $400 million in direct income from renting out their properties via the service. South African oil shares down 14.8% this year. Dollar versus rand lasted 13.8205. Egyptian pound 17.903. Nigerian oil shares down 17.17% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange is negative minus 0.85%. Al-Shabaab, or Ansa al-Sunnah, or al sunnah while Jamo, no one is sure what to call the attackers. This is in northern Mozambique. Um, but one security source said LNG security company owned by Eric Prince, founder of Blackwater, is promising to flatten Al-Shabaab in three months. This is in exchange for a hefty slice of oil and gas revenues. Uniting Africa for power is an article by uh, Tony Blair talking about regional electricity markets. Nairobi is hosting the Blue Economy Conference. I wrote an article, uh, Blue Sky Opportunity. When you look at the blue economy, it has an asset value of $24 trillion. And that's delivering something between four and $500 billion each year in terms of the dividend to humanity, says Professor Ove Hulk Guldberg. And this is a poster from conference. I wrote a piece on the 6th of November about the shilling. Everyone had gotten very, very bearish, but during last week the shilling gained 0.7% against the dollar to close at 102.40 from 103.2. The NSC is currently trading at a PE ratio of 11.1 and a dividend yield of 5%.
The Nairobi All Shares down 15.81% year to date. Safaricom has been trading at the 23.75 level for about six weeks. The NSE 20 is down 25.62% year to date. Centum Investment Company reported first half earnings per share surged to 64.25%. Trading profit was lower at 389.816 million from 548.919 million. Um, investment and other income surged to 4.09 billion from 2.2 billion. I'll come to that in a moment. Finance costs much higher, 1.23 billion versus 557.27 uh, million. Profit before tax, 2.39 billion versus 1.765. Profit after tax, 2.079 billion versus 1.631 billion. Earnings per share, three shillings and 40 cents versus two shillings and seven cents. They had a one-off gain of 1.2 billion after completing the sale of their stake in Gen Africa Asset Managers. Private equity business reported a 300% profit growth, as saying, real estate revenue potential for pre-sales achieved was 1.8 billion. That's good, that's on their Bipingo project. Um, and uh, saying their company's debt service remains strong with debt service charge ratio consistently above the minimum level set under its various debt covenants. They're highly accomplished at upsizing and downsizing risk effectively. 1.2 billion was a one-off. The yields on the five and 10-year euro bonds would just have under a year for the five-year and 5.6 years to maturity on the 10-year. These were issued in 2014. Both increased to 5.8% and 8.2% respectively. The February 2018 issue, 10 and 30 year, rose to 9.1 and 9.9% respectively. So the 30 year is nearly in double digits now. Standard Chartered released Q3 earnings, recording EPS growth of 33.9%. Um, uh, share price data is there, market cap $630 million, trading PE 9.572. Barclays released Q3, EPS grew 2%. Share price data is there as well, PE is 8.9. Uh, DTB released uh, Q3, EPS up 10%. They're on a PE of 6.153. Stanbic released uh, results with a profit after tax increased 46.7%. We saw this at the half year mark. Um, this is a buy. PE is 8.486. Uh, the, the cabinet secretary, Najib Balala, went to New York in a very Sun Tzu response to some of the criticisms that have been coming. And finally, let me leave you with private sector credit growth has remained unchanged at 4.3% since July to September but this has been the highest growth rate since December 2016. Thank you for stopping by.